What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. That was pretty damn good. I am Nicholas. This is BDGE. This is a BDGE sweatshirt. A lot of y'all ask where you can get merch. Swaggy ass little retro logo going on. BigDogsFantasy.com. That's the website. That's where we host our blog. That's where we host our store. BigDogsFantasy.com. Y'all could figure it out on their shop store or something like that. If you use the promo code COVID, you'll get 19% off. I literally just thought about that off the top of my head. So I'm giving y'all 19% off, which means we're probably going to be losing money every time you guys buy something. Unfortunately, today's going to be a good day. Today's got borderline great day because we're going to finish up our running back rankings for the top 20. 2020, top 20 fantasy football all 20 20 20 20 20 it's my mic on we did about four or five prequels to this already so if you missed the first three seasons featured films you don't want to skip ahead in the series we did one through six we did seven through 12 we did 13 14 and 15 that was a whole featured film just talking shit about uncle lenny pretty much but now we're doing 16 through 20 which will be the final installment of this i'll probably get to wide receivers afterwards if at any time you want to grab our top 24 running back rankings that will be linked down below there will be a little bit of link you just click on it when you enter your email you will be redirected to the top 24 running back rankings so that's what we got on tap today i don't got much else to say other than we only drinking out of mason jars for the rest of the, my life as a wise man once told me Tuck your shirt and stop yelling. Let's eat. As always, we got to give a little bit of love to the homies walking around right now with their AirPods in, listening via podcast only. Thank you for the review. I smoke weed guy, Alex from CT, new listener. Been an FF degenerate for most of my life. Blown away at what you guys got going on here. Absolute fuego setup. I hope you guys blow up. But at the same time, I'll be using you guys as a secret weapon this year in my league. So don't get too big too fast. Never that. We don't outscale ourselves. Much love. P.S. Subscribe to YouTube as well. Shout out Mike and Noah. Let's get Noah a go fund me going or something for a mic love those guys fuck yeah you know what i'm gonna set up a gofundme so by the time y'all watch this video that gofundme will be linked down below any little donation helps out one dollar two dollars a billion dollars a zillion dollars even would go a long way so we're gonna set up a gofundme to get noah a uh, new mic i was actually hold on no joke when we moved when i moved into this new apartment i was thinking of like random shit that i could buy for it to decorate a little bit and i got us a little piggy bank uh, when we're all going to start working here together i was going to put a sign on this that just said the next shore microphone this is a shore company microphone so anyone that had changed we'd throw it in here and then every time we hit you know 400 500 600 bucks we'd buy a new microphone for the studio so listen we had that on on our mind but we we're only going to be working within the confines of our community now we're going to outreach to you guys because i love you and you guys are the best fucking fans and community in the goddamn world so that gofundme will be linked down down below love you for that so thank you for the review alex the uh the review's been popping off you are listening via itunes a rating and review would be highly 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 appreciated i'm gonna rip off the top 15 for y'all that are not up to speed thus far we have c mac at the 101 or rb1 saquon zeke dalvin cook alvin kamara Derek henry miles sanders joe mixon josh jankups nick chubb Kenyon drake clyde edwards hilaire austin eckler aaron jones and uncle leonard Fournette. So now we dive into 16 through 20. As I preface with the whole Leonard Fournette thing, most of these guys who are going in the third round, I am a giant tear break off of them. Okay. So when Aaron Jones is my RB 14, as I said, last video, I'm not very comfortable drafting him in, you know, the early third round. You might even have to get him in the er uh, the late second round, which is a fucking absolute no-go for me. It's like having a one-night stand with a girl and she tells you not to put a condom on. That's when you walk away. That's like AJ Dillon in this situation is the Trojan. Someone that is not highly, highly, highly appreciated, but probably should be is Chris Carson of the Seattle Seahawks. He is my running back 16. His current ADP, while I think I'm underwhelmed on, on Chris Carson in terms of how much I should be appreciating him, he's actually going off the board at the 401 right now, running back 20. I'll never forget the first time I saw Chris Carson run. And if you're a true, true OG, 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 like three years ago when he first came in the league, I remember watching him in his preseason, his rookie year, and I was enamored with this dude. I was like, holy 
holy shit. Why do we not know about this guy? He's fucking physical, full of burst. He's chiseled straight from the gods. My problem with Chris Carson, he's one of those players where if you own him, it always feels like you never feel good about it. You're always like one thing away from him not being in your lineup anymore. You know what I mean? Like you never really feel good about Chris Carson. Like you feel good from like week to week, but it always feels like something's just about to go wrong and Chris Carson is no longer going to be in the picture. Whether it's like injuries, a younger running back coming in and taking time, whether it's the fumble issues, like there's always something there in the back of your mind. It seems like Pete Carroll kind of keeps him on a short leash and we actually started to see that last year before Rashad Penny got hurt. Like right before he tore his ACL later in the season, them two started splitting work 50-50. I like this pick by Seattle, DJ Dallas, fourth round rookie pick out of Miami. I like the kid a lot. I think he's super talented. I think he's very, very versatile. So for y'all not familiar with this kid, DJ Dallas, and you just look at like his player profile or picks or something, you might think he's super underwhelming, but the kid played wide receiver at Miami, then switched over to running back. And that's why he never really got a full workload because he was mid position switch. So he's very raw as, as a runner, but he's very versatile, like really good turn man so he can catch he could return he's athletic he could play all over the field on any down pretty much so DJ Dallas does pose a threat but him and Carson are very very different players in terms of like how they could be utilized but there's no arguing that Chris Carson is just an absolute monster you see some of these picks from PFF most missed tackles forced on runs since 2017 Chris Carson is only behind Henry and Kareem Hunt which is insane considering Kareem Hunt has like barely played any game. Most rushing yards after contact, only Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb have more than Chris Carson. So while we expected Rashad Penny last year to be his biggest competition, you know, that's obviously not going to be the case coming into 2019 because Rashad Penny's coming off a midseason, I believe it was like week 13 or some shit, ACL tear. So we expect him to miss significant time. If there, if Pete Carroll's already coming out and saying that he's not expected to be ready for week one, you know that's going to be a problem. They expect him to start on the pup list, which means he's going to miss at least the first six games of the season. On the flip side, Carson, who suffered his hip fracture, is expected to be ready by week one. So those are reports you're going to have to follow. And I don't know if it's true or not, how healthy he'll be. But if he is going to be healthy, then he's probably set up in a position to really, really, really eat. When you look at his workload last year, man, it was actually way higher than I even realized. It was consistently really, really high. Carson played in a total of 15 games in 2019. He had 16 touches or more in 87% of the games. Now you see week 16 listed there. That was the week that he left in the second quarter with the fractured hip. If you take that out, right? Like we, we don't want to use that against numbers to predict what he's going to do going forward. So you take week 16 out, that number of games and percentage of term in terms of 16 touches or more, 93% of his games last year had 16 or more touches. You could see the column all the way to the right that's lit up in either green or red. That's the touch count for game to game. 86% of the games, he had 18 plus touches last year. And you could see the games where he had 16 or fewer touches, right? It was week 16 where he left with the hip injury. The other two games in week 12 when he had 12 touches, that was the week that he, I know a lot of you guys probably remember this, when he fumbled on back-to-back -back plays. And then in week three, he had 16 touches where he fumbled for the third time in three weeks. So he started the season off fumbling and fumbling and fumbling. Any of the games in which he did not have fumble issues though his workload was massive 21 26 28 28 24 20 18 28 24 18 25 so the the fact that Carson is going so low right in the fourth round you can get him as your RB2 undoubtedly you rarely ever find guys in that range that have legitimate everyone talks about like 20 touch upside but very 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 few running backs outside of like the Ezekiel Elliott's and those guys really get 20 touches in a game more than like twice or once or twice in a season Chris Carson got over 20 touches in 64 percent of his games last year he had over 24 touches in 50 percent of the game you look at Rashad Penny almost definitely opening up on the pup list you look at DJ Dallas as a prospect to actually think that right now he's ready to compete as a, as a real competitor for Chris Carson for work I think is a bit of a stretch for even even if the you are the biggest fan of DJ Dallas I don't think he comes in there and any in any way takes a job from Chris Carson so it's even possible that having him at RB 16 is way 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 too low I just think that when you factor in that like you know fantasy is a feeling game too man you gotta you gotta feel your gut out a little bit and you have to understand, especially with running backs, right? Like mo most players uh, outside of the running back position 
aren't really on a short leash. Or if they are, it's very noticeable, like quarterbacks in a sense, right? Like Derek Carr with Marcus Mariota right behind him, etc. With Chris Carson, it always feels like he's on a very short leash. So I kind of factor that in. Like if you think he's a, an RB1, you think he's like the 12th running back overall, you, you consider the competition, you consider the fumbling issues, you consider his, his long injury history at this point. And I think that needs to be in the range of outcomes, the spectrum, right? You can't just always jump to highest case scenario or best case scenario and highest ceiling for a player like that. So that needs to be factored in when you're drafting and if you do that with all players you'll end up with a very solid all-around team that mixes their risk their rewards their upside their downside correctly into a beautiful 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 cocktail during happy hour i also want to bring up a tweet that i saw yesterday from a guy named bobby stripe maybe so this guy is I, i'll be honest with you i didn't really look too much into who he is personally and like what exactly he does but he is a functional training coach and as you on his twitter he's working out with patrick mahomes so i'm, I'm guessing he's like the physical trainer for a lot of high-end 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 athletes and he tweeted out yesterday he said an observation on athletes after reopening this week so he runs like a training facility they are dangerously out of shape usually out of 1500 athletes a summer we have about four that get faint we had seven today and two of them passed out. So usually over the course of the summer, athletes come in way, 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 way more in shape. And he said four of them, you know, out of the entire summer usually get faint. He said individually they had seven today and two of them actually passed out in a mobility circuit. It was not hard or advanced work. So coaches, please be ready. The next tweet under that in the thread was, as we all know, social media posts of someone doing a drill isn't training. Can't fake it when you are back with your team. Those are the things that I talk about a lot. Like when you see your favorite player doing something in shorts, it doesn't fucking matter. It makes no difference whether or not your feet look quick or you can catch a pass on an open field in shorts with nobody covering you. But this is really significant for the fact that people, you know, I mean, this is just personal shit like myself and you, you, it's very hard to stay motivated to work out while we're at home, while we don't have the proper facilities and equipment and gyms out there. So athletes, while yes, they are paid to stay in shape. I mean, this is a mental battle for a lot of people. And as you can see, this is actual physical evidence that a lot of athletes are coming in out of shape. That can be a big, big factor in injuries. The fact that we're getting a shortened summer, it's it just, you need to be like really, really, really in tune with the reports that we're going to hear all summer with guys that are out of shape, because a lot of them will probably, come in and be behind the eight ball so I do think that gives backups uh, a chance if they stayed in really really good shape throughout the summer to compete with the starters man that that is a jump that we might see more often in 2020 I also think a lot of guys are going to be more susceptible to injuries so maybe guys coming back from injuries are at a higher risk because now their conditioning is ramping up at a much slower pace this season overall the point I'm getting at is this season overall is going to be funky it's going to be very very difficult to predict a lot of things because the variation of the way that we're going into the season compared to normal years is going to make a lot of things very, 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 very funky. So you really just got to stay on the ball and always be tuned into reports. As I always say, the best thing you could possibly do for yourself as a fantasy person is to be on Twitter. Go on Twitter, sign up for a Twitter. You could follow me. If you follow me and then go look at all the people I follow, I only follow about 300 people. All of them are like fantasy related. So just go follow the people I follow. You will be in tune with what's going on into the fantasy world because you're going to need it now more than ever during this offseason. All right. So at number 17, we have another veteran running back. That is the newly signed Melvin Gordon to the Denver Broncos. He's currently going off the board at the 308. So the end of the third round, RB 18. So in terms of actual running back rankings, I am higher on consensus, but he will definitely not be at the 308 on my board. This leads to the fact that Denver clearly, you know, thinks and knows that Royce Freeman ain't it. But this is still going to be a committee in Denver. Like, I, I hate to be the one to break this to you, but Melvin Gordon is not getting that 20 touch a game mark. He's not hitting that. I would be surprised if he's even getting like 18 touches a game, to be honest with you. And I will continue to go on record with the fact that I believe at this point in their careers, Philip Lindsay is just a better runner. Not a better all-around running back, but a better runner. Melvin Gordon was brought to Denver because he brings a lot of traits to that backfield and just to that team overall that they did not have, right? He is an all-around back. He can run the ball. He's big. He's bruising if he needs to be. He can be elusive when he needs to be. Most importantly, he can catch passes. With Philip Lindsay, he is a very, very good runner. Ex extremely extinctual, extremely burstful, and can break away that big play. But they need someone who can go deep into the season and not start to wear down and carry the ball 250 times, you know, without having to worry about him being on the field or not being on the field. But Lindsey is 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 very much going to be involved. And don't be surprised if by, you know, six weeks, eight weeks into the season, Lindsey and Melvin Gordon are splitting carries 50-50. 
as I said, where I think Melvin's going to thrive is going to be in this passing game. So Lindsey and, and Freeman have both been really, really bad in the receiving game. You might not notice this because it's not like a big part of their game, but Lindsey has gotten almost 50 targets a season in both of his first two seasons. He has ranked 24th and 39th in terms of yards per route run amongst running backs. And Royce has been even way worse than that. And as we know, as you may not might not know, sorry, it's early in the morning. I need to get some more coffee in me. Um, yards per route run is one of the more predictive statistics in terms of like how good a player is in the passing game. And both of them have ranked very, 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 very poorly. And this is where Gordon has thrived, right? He did not come into the league as someone who was hyped up for his receiving ability, but he has shown year in, year out to be a very, very, very valid pass catcher, very reliable out of the backfield. So this is what I think they were looking for in Denver. He also, again, gives them a bigger body to pair with Philip Lindsay, especially down the stretch. Gordon makes sure that both of these guys will stay fresh throughout the the majority of the season this should be a much better offense overall I think both of these guys both Melvin Gordon and Philip Lindsay right now where Melvin Gordon's going I don't think he's a value in drafts I think Philip Lindsay has been so forgotten about that he is becoming a value in drafts like I get him in best ball in like the 10th or 11th round which is insane to me and I think both of them have a chance to be very very efficient in 2020 their offensive line is actually very underrated for run blocking and their offense is going to be way more high powered. I don't want to just throw the word high powered out there, but they're going to be uh, presenting themselves with a lot more scoring opportunities in 2020 than they did in 2019. Just looking up how they loaded up the weapons, right? This draft, Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, KJ Hamler, Albert O, Noah Fant, Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay. Like they have a very formidable offense and it's because they want to compete with the Chiefs. Obviously they know if they want to compete with the Chiefs in two, three years, they need to start building for it right now. So they're going to be a lot more explosive, opening up more scoring opportunities, but that offensive line ranked 14th last year in run blocking per PFF. They ranked 11th in run blocking per football outsiders. They go ahead. They add Cushionberry from LSU in this draft. He's a plus run, uh, run blocking lineman. But more importantly, they signed Graham Glasgow, previously the Detroit Lions, four year, $44 million deal in free agency. Agency. He was the sixth highest graded run blocking guard in the NFL last year. So at worst, at worst, they're going to be probably an above average run blocking offensive line. Maybe worth noting that the Broncos are reportedly one of the three teams in talks with Jason Peters. The offense as a whole, I think is going to be just better under Pat Shermer. He's not an offensive genius, but he definitely pushes the ball down the field more than they have in recent years. And I think all, you know, all of the weapons that they've added to this offense just mean a better overall offense, which should be good for Melvin Gordon. So don't be surprised when Melvin Gordon catches 45 to 55 passes this year and scores, you know, eight to 10 times. I really, really like Melvin Gordon's outlook this year as a value play if he does drop in drafts. Right now, third round is probably a little bit too rich for me. Not, not too rich for Le'Veon Bell, who held out and got the fat sack from the New York Jets last year. Completely tanked when it comes to fantasy football, but Le'Veon might be bike. Le'Veon could be bike. Currently going off the board 311 RB19. Again, I will not be touching him at the 311, but also these ADPs are not via Superflex. Very important to note. So if you add in quarterbacks going via Superflex, most of these guys, you know, Le'Veon Bell would probably be early fifth round, and I think that's probably around the right spot. With Le'Veon Bell, here's here's what we're going to talk about. Whole volume is king situation, right? I broke that down pretty, pretty, pretty deeply, uh, very much in depth in the last episode when we talked about Leonard Fournette, how I talked, just a quick recap, you know, if a running back gets 300 touches, gets a very high workload and is extremely inefficient, coaches adapt, offensive coordinators adapt. They don't say, oh, okay, so we want to we want to feed Le'Veon Bell who averaged 3.2 yards per carry another 300 touches this year because that's a really good game plan. His 3.2 yards per carry and seven yards per reception last year were both career lows for Le'Veon Bell. His 350 touches were not efficient touches. I absolutely hated Le'Veon Bell where he was going last year in the draft. It was very easy to see. Under Adam Gase, who's a terrible head coach, offensive-minded coach, they had no offensive line. Their offense was mediocre at best. It was a very easy situation to steer away from with Le'Veon Bell this year. However, the price, the pricing of Le'Veon Bell last year was like late first, early second round. Now it's like a fourth or fifth round price tag where I think he makes a lot more sense coming around. The outlook is nearly identical from last year to this year when it comes to Le'Veon Bell. You have a floor of production. For those of y'all trying to catch lightning in a bottle, like thinking that Bell is going to come back to his Steeler days, like that's not it. You're drafting Bell in the fourth or fifth round, knowing what kind of production you're going to get. You're not drafting him in the fourth or fifth round 
being like, oh, he has, you know, top eight running back ceiling. Like, no, you're drafting RB, RB2 or RB3 production for Bell, knowing that that's exactly what he's going to give you. I think Bell is a pick that makes sense if your roster that far into the draft needs him. Maybe you took Mark Andrews in the third or fourth round. Maybe you took Dak Prescott in the second or third round or Kyler Murray or something like that. A wide receiver as well. So maybe you have one running back. Maybe you have no running backs and you're just like, I want production at the running back position rather than shooting for a very high up side guy at this point you know the floor that you're getting with Le'Veon Bell the ceiling though people need to stop making up fucking ceilings that don't exist for every running back that's from like running back 15 to 55 oh his ceiling is like RB1 it's like no it's fucking not he's like 30 years old in a shitty offense the ceiling is not there guys but you know what the floor is which makes him a pick that might make sense for your team the fake math equations just just need to stop what else do we got in this backfield they draft I still don't know if it's LaMichael or Lamical P Ryan in the fourth round I hate P Ryan as a prospect I've documented this many times said do not draft p ryan he's literally the slower next version of buck allen as the ogs on this channel know him as suck allen the deck the definition of get the ball and fall his senior year he had a 40 catch senior year so you might look at the stats and be like oh he's a contributor in the passing game but that was prefaced by three terrible receiving campaigns in the three years prior he couldn't do it as a freshman a sophomore or a junior his 40 catches in that senior year, 6.6 yards per reception were really, really, really poor. As you could see down below, that ranked 147th out of like 150 NCAA running backs. His yards per target were 143rd. Broken tackle rate on receptions, 89th. And then him as a runner was even worse. His broken tackle rate, this is per Sports Info Solutions, over the last three years, 89th, 94th, 135th. So again, he is just the least efficient running back that we're going to see come out of the fucking NFL draft in the top four rounds, probably of the entire class. P. Ryan, I think think holds no threat to Le'Veon Bell and I mean I don't even what do you what do you even say about Frank Gore anymore I don't know Bell is still the guy is he is he gonna get the 21 touches a game like he saw last year probably not I think we'll probably see him more so in that that like 18 range but getting an 18 touch guy in the round five of your fantasy draft could definitely be worse they do upgrade their offensive lineup they signed Connor McGovern formerly of the Broncos three-year 30 million dollar deal Greg Van Roten of the Panthers George Fan of the Seahawks three years 30 million dollars none of them game changers but all upgrades considering what they had last year. Big move was getting Mekhi Becton, 11th overall pick in the draft this year. Also worth noting, as I said with the Broncos, there's three teams currently talking to Jason Peters. The Broncos were one, the Jets were the other one. So if they do end up picking up Jason Peters, that is another big upgrade for this offense. A bit of an improved offensive line, very little competition, and hopefully we get Darnold for the full 16 games. Last year, you know, Darnold obviously missed some time with Mono. Shit's gonna happen when you're a 22-year-old kid and you live in New York City, occupational hazard. But if you just remember the, the game's they played without Darnold. I mean, their quarterbacks were like literally replacement college level guys and Le'Veon Bell had no prayer of putting up any sort of efficient number. So I do think a little bit of that was buoyed down by that. Hopefully we get him for a full 16. Again, though, Bell is a guy that you don't target thinking that you're getting upside from him at running back 18 or 19 in the fourth round. You know what you're getting from him. And if that fits your team, if you're okay with that, then you draft him. Otherwise, if you fade the running back position and you're like, I just want to shoot for high upside guys, no, 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 no. Running back 19 in my rankings. Half PPR. Chicago Bears, David Montgomery. Currently going off the board at the 412 running back 24. So if you basically just take that whole last spiel I made about Bell, he's not a guy I love this year by any means, but if you end up going wide receiver or tight end early, he's a guy you could plug into your RB2 role and get good if not you know, pretty solid RB2 production. The same thing could pretty much be said about Montgomery. I mean, you want to talk about Le'Veon Bell's team adding little competition. The Bears literally didn't bring in anything to compete with David Montgomery, right? They have Terry Cohen on the, in the backfield. They have Ryan something Niall or some shit who's like a tight end he was an undrafted free agent they bring in another undrafted free agent so they, they literally did did nothing to change their backfield this year and that echoes the statement from the Bears GM Ryan Pace when he said that David Montgomery can be the team's featured back and carry a heavier load in 2020 so this lines up Montgomery to pretty much take all of the carries out of the backfield when you look at the play dichotomy between him and Terry Cohen I mean David Montgomery had 242 carries Terry Cohen had 64 last year Terry Cohen played out wide or from the slot 
on 42.2% of his snaps. I talked about how Austin Eckler was at like 33% once Melvin Gordon got back, and that was ridiculously high. I'm going to repeat that. Tyree Cohen, over 42% of his snaps last year came out wide or from the slot. David Montgomery is the running back there. Taylor Gabriel gone, maybe that means even more snaps from the slot or out wide for a guy like Tariq Cohen. So the Tariq Cohen discussion stops here. It's literally Mon Montgomery and nobody else. However, their, their offensive line is really bad still for run blocking. There's no way around it, and they did virtually nothing to address it in the offseason, which is extremely questionable and what's ma what makes me nervous about Montgomery. We could see another season where this dude is getting 200 160 touches averaging 3.8 you know maybe 4.0 yards per carry and I think when you're depending on hopefully a little bit more like touchdown luck or some shit like that you put yourself in a vulnerable position when it comes to your team you don't give yourself a lot of leverage that way the one thing I do really like though is the fact that they bring in Nick Foles I don't know how the quarterback situation is gonna end up right now Vegas does have Nick Foles as the favorite to start in week one I like that for all the skill players involved I like that for Allen Robinson I like that for Anthony Miller and I like that for David Montgomery, right? The mobile quarterback thing, which I've talked about so many times already for these running back rankings videos. Mr. Trubisky, right? Averaging around four carries a game. You're not going to get that with Nick Foles, right? He averages like one carry a game. And I'm pretty sure that's only like a technical stat because he gets sacked and they count those as fucking carries. But that could be the difference for Montgomery between like 27 receptions and 39 receptions and brings you from RB22 to, to RB16. I mean, Nick Foles is not a game changer by any means, but like imagine opposing defenses preparing for Mitch Trubisky. Trubisky. It's basically like, it's basically like, how can I put this? Like in, in little league, when, uh, when a kid shows a bunt and everybody creeps up, like the third baseman is playing closer to the batter than the fucking pitcher is. Cause he showed bunt and he's like, this kid ain't going to hit the ball anyways. He's not afraid whatsoever of getting hit with a fucking line drive in the domicile. That's how defense is basically played against Mitch Trubisky last year. So Nick Foles, by no means is he a great quarterback, but he presents more of a difficult time for opposing defenses than Mr. Trubisky did. So I like that for David Montgomery. Overall, again, there are definitely concerns just given the offensive line, just given the offense as a whole. There's going to be problems there. David Montgomery does not really show burst. He's not someone who's going to pick up chunk gains and rattle off, you know, 30-yard runs, 60-yard runs or anything like that. So his ceiling is definitely capped. But just like Le'Veon Bell, the floor is there for almost, he's almost guaranteed like 260 to 275 touches if he could stay stay healthy and stay on the field and we have officially arrived at our final running back ranking in the top 20 so if y'all have enjoyed this video thus far uh all i ask is that y'all hit the button that's similar to this not the one that looks like this please i obviously put a lot of time and research and, and effort into these videos so it's appreciative by me to see y'all fuck with it and enjoy it and dropping comments down below about what you think and you know even arguing with me i love those fucking comments because i win arguments every single time but it's cute to see you guys argue with me it really is yeah so that that thumbs up button is very much appreciated if you subscribe to the channel if you're new that's also appreciated we love to see the community grow speaking of community if you want to join our discord channel that will be linked down below our discord channel is fucking popping off right now we got over 40 startup dynasty leagues going we might be at like 50 by the time that this episode comes out so if you're interested in joining a dynasty startup league for paid for free whatever we got all of them popping off so join the discord channel and it's just a community of people talking football and fantasy literally 24 7 it's fucking incredible that will be linked below running back number 20 devin pringle terry once you pop the fun don't stop currently going off the board at the 409 as the running back 23 i really wanted to love singletary this year i really did but the zach moss pick by the buffalo bills in the draft this year makes makes you really 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 uncomfortable about taking devin singletary which is unfortunate given the rookie year he had because the guy played in 12 games and he had nearly a thousand total yards from scrimmage so it was by all means a very very good rookie year for Devin Singletary but back to Moss they came out and they draft Moss in the third round and they immediately say that Moss takes right this is straight from from being the GM Moss will take that Frank Gore role he will get a lot of short yardage work he will get a lot of goal line work that kills Singletary's touchdown upside so any like real upside he had is fucking trounced by Zach Moss being on the Buffalo Bills the Bills had 18 goal line carries last year. Frank Gore saw 11 of them. Josh Allen saw five of them, which left two for Devin Singletary. I think Singletary's touchdown upside is, is very much capped at like five or six. 
but maybe I'm wrong, right? He had four touchdowns in 12 games last year, but without any goal line work, I mean, Moss will certainly be more efficient than Gore on the ground as well. So it's, it's just hard to bank on production out of the touchdown total side of things for a guy like Devin Singletary. This is an offense that's obviously on the up and up, a very solid offensive line, very committed to the run. And Singletary should catch a ton of passes in 2020. You know, if you discount the two games, he didn't play because of injury, right? The game that he left early and the game that he first came back from like a three or four week absence last year. He only played in like 30% of the snaps in those two games. So we discount those. The other games, the other 10 games that he did play, Singletary saw six or more targets in four of the 10 games, and he caught three or more passes in six of the 10 games. So he was very involved. And if you pace out his normal passing numbers, like he could be on, on pace to catch, you know, 45 to 55 passes. But again, the problem just comes back to Moss. He's going to be very involved like Frank Gore was. Frank Gore was literally a machine just turning out 11 carries for 42 yards every single week. Very, very involved in the goal line, right? Like I said, 11 of the 18 goal line carries went to Frank Gore. Zach Moss is going to see probably those 10 to 12 carries right out of the gate and get the majority of the goal line carries. And you also are always going to be competing with Josh Allen down there as a, as a mobile quarterback. He's someone who's going to run it on the goal line, even when it's a passing play. I still think, you know, Singletary will probably see his 12 to 13 carries a game, have games where he gets 15, 16, 17 carries. But Diggs, Stefan Diggs coming in as a true number one, they finally have like a real alpha on this team. He should command like 20 to 23% of the team's targets. And Buffalo was already one of the run heaviest teams in the NFL, right? 45% of their plays were via the ground, which was the seventh highest rate, highest rate in the NFL. So overall volumes, the volume of targets might be capped for Singletary with Diggs coming in and just being a run heavy offense. So it's just, it's an exciting player, but just not an exciting situation. So I hate to rain on the Singletary parade, but it just doesn't make much sense to me, given that there's not a lot of room for his ceiling to come to fruition. Again, if y'all want the top 24 rankings, that will be linked right down below. Standard half PPR and full PPR, that was not available before, but now it is. So if you want all my running back ones, all my running back two rankings, there's a link down below. Click it, it'll take you to a page. You throw your email in and bing bang boom rankings in the room that will also sign you up for our newsletter which i'm really 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 excited came out last week it's our it's our new weekly newsletter letting you know everything that's going on behind the brand all the best things that we see on twitter we're trying to give you fantasy value we're trying to give you life value after all this is a lifestyle brand and i love that your lifestyle includes watching these videos with me the love is unreal it's unmatched i don't know what i would do without my internet friends so thank you all for watching this week hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed subscribe to the channel if you're new and i will see y'all on thursday